Hello everyone. Welcome to part two of chapter 11, Health and Sexuality. Where we left off last time, we had talked about um, a variety of health conditions, including uh, things like dementias and Alzheimer's and traumatic brain injury, and how those um, conditions can impact sexuality, both for people who live with those conditions and for the people who care for them. Um, and are involved in intimate relationships with them. Our next topic is on uh, intellectual and neurodevelopmental disabilities and sexuality. And, and here we, we have to kind of open the lifespan perspective of this and look at how issues of sexuality for people with intellectual disabilities and people with other neurodevelopmental disabilities such as autism spectrum disorder how their parents need to navigate and how other caregivers need to navigate um, sexuality as people with these disabilities move into adulthood. And the issues are complex. Um, I will pause here for a second and say that um, I've posted a number of links in the chapter 11 section on D2L that I may or may not have referred to um, during last the the part one presentation and this presentation i have posted um, a link to a national organization that is um, an, both an information clearinghouse but also a an advocacy organization for people with intellectual disabilities and what it is is a you know a, a general statement on how the organization perceives the importance of sexual expression and intimate relationships in their population. So first, um, intellectual disability in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual used to be referred to as um, mental retardation. That term has been removed and has been replaced with intellectual disability. Um, it's a broad category. There are lots of different causes and lots of levels of, of effect. Um, the, the focus in the DSM has been on um, deficits in um, learning, in cognition, changes in emotionality, but mostly in adaptive behaviors. So how well can people um, achieve the, the basic functions of everyday living? Um, there are levels of severity going from mild to moderate to severe to profound. And those levels are designed to help people to understand what's the level of support and assistance that this individual might need. Um, the focus, as I mentioned before, has been on adaptive behaviors. So how well can people cope with daily living tasks such as dressing, eating, um, uh, maintaining hygiene, um, maintaining a schedule, things like that. Um, then you know, other daily living tasks such as shopping, um, maintaining appropriate food supplies. Um, if the person is a student, how well do they cope with the classroom environment and are they able to get assignments in on time and things like that. As people move from mild to profound on that continuum, they were, those are individuals who require increasing levels of support to achieve those adaptive behaviors. Um, sexuality education historically has been lacking for people in this population. The stereotype is that people with intellectual and neurodevelopmental disabilities are asexual beings or they should be. Um, and when they express sexuality, it's probably in a deviant way. So those are very negative stigmatizing um, stereotypes. Uh, people with neurodevelopmental Neuro neurodevelopmental disabilities and intellectual disabilities have very much the same kinds of intimacy needs that uh, people without those disabilities have. So this, the stigmatizing belief that they should adopt an asexual lifestyle is um, widely viewed now is inappropriate. Still though, um, multi-level, sorry, my dog is being very loud. Asta. Stop. Yes, she's down there being really super noisy. All right. So as I said, sexuality education for people with intellectual disabilities 
continues to be limited and spotty in different locations. Um, many educators argue that uh, sexuality should be considered, regardless of who you're talking about, it should be considered a basic human right. Um, a natural part of human expression is the need for intimacy and the need for sexual intimacy. That said, educators say that any education provided to people with intellectual and neurodevelopmental disabilities and their families should take into consideration concerns about the capacity for consent and the capacity to, to engage in sexual behaviors without bad consequences. And those bad consequences can be, um, just for example, um, not understanding how to give consent and then revoke it if one becomes uncomfortable and therefore a negative consequence could be being sexually assaulted or how to understand when another person is revoking consent and therefore committing a sexual assault. Um, given that there's currently a general lack of education that's comprehensive, many uh, people with intellectual and neurodevelopmental disorders report that they don't see themselves as people who um, should be engaging in intimate relationships. So they may see themselves not being sexual beings. Um, and that's unfortunate um, because they still continue to report in uh, survey studies that it's something they feel is lacking in their lives, that they um, would like to have intimate relationships, they would like to marry or be otherwise in a committed relationship and so on. Um, frequently they report that other people, for example, parents or caregivers or treatment providers um, either stop them from or limit their access to intimate relationships um, uh, for, for a variety of reasons, but the fact of the matter is that they do it. Um, so you know, when you, you go back to this idea that many sexuality educators who are involved in this area, they, um, they really look at sexuality and sexual expression as a human right. Um, so that's become a focus of policymakers in this area. Another uh, category of disability or health concern is mental illness. Um, that's a very broad concept, mental illness. If you, you think about the range of potential disorders that people could be diagnosed with, it's very broad. Um, probably some of the concepts that pop into your mind when you say the phrase mental illness are things like depression and anxiety, post-traumatic stress, obsessive compulsive disorder, eating disorders, um, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia disorder, um, personality disorders, and so on and so on and so on. Um, mental illnesses like neurodevelopmental disorders, while the DSM doesn't emphasize adaptive functioning, mental illnesses range from being mild and transitory to being severe and chronic. Um, so there's no one uh, kind of description of how mental illness may or may not influence sexuality. Clearly there are some mental illnesses that have sexual components to them. For example, in bipolar disorder, um, some people during the manic phase of their disorder become intensely hypersexual, um, meaning their sex drive is in overdrive. They seek out partners, um, they seek out inappropriate partners, appropriate partners um, in, in all kinds of situations. Um, and there are a couple of other disorders where uh, increased sexual drive uh, can occur just as a part of the illness. Bipolar tends to be the, the quick example that comes to mind. Occasionally for some people with schizophrenia who have manic features, they may also report um, hypersexual intensity uh, as a part of their illness. In other cases, mental illnesses can impact people, for instance, in chronic, uh, not chronic, in uh, major depression, people report pretty routinely that their drive towards sexuality goes down, that they are not uh, as interested, they can't get aroused as easily, they can't achieve orgasm as easily, um, and that's, that's a major uh, uh, impact on sexual expression. Anxiety disorders similarly. Um, many people with anxiety disorders such as post-traumatic stress, um, panic disorder, 
um, and, and to a somewhat lesser extent OCD report that there are times when they, they feel too consumed by the, the emotional challenges presented by their illnesses to feel aroused or to feel attracted, to feel interested. Um, add to the potential for the symptoms of mental illnesses to interfere with sex drive and sexual functioning, some of the medications that are used to treat psychological disorders, such as antidepressant medications and antipsychotic medications, um, many of them have sexual side effects, primarily um, reducing sex drive, reducing arousal rates, and interfering with the capacity for, for orgasm. Not all of the medications do this, but that's certainly a concern that many people have when they think about um, taking these medications. Chronic pain is uh, an issue for sexuality and sexual expression. Pain can come from lots of different things. Um, I've uh, included a link for you from, from the Cleveland Clinic, excuse me, about people's reactions to, cle to, to chronic pain, uh, particularly in terms of uh, how chronic pain may interfere with their sexual satisfaction and their sexual function. Um, many people report when they experience chronic pain, they may report being um, if they have to have accommodations to engage in sexual interactions, they may fear being rejected by their partner because they feel inadequate or inept um, in per performing the, the sex act. They may fear being in pain um, when they're having sex with their partner and they may fear that they will ultimately be unable to perform, for instance, if their pain level increases while they're engaged in intimate activities. The Cleveland Clinic um, also recommends some alternatives. So, you know, like all uh, kind of chronic health conditions, if partners are going to continue to have um, a high value sexual interactions, meaning sexual interactions that are gratifying and enjoyable for both parties, um, they may need to negotiate that. They may need to navigate that by talking about it before they um, engage in actual sexual behaviors. For some people with chronic pain, they are always in pain. So how um, do you as a, as a couple kind of talk about how do we make our intimate sexual experiences less likely to cause you more pain and to in fact cause you less. Um, so you can explore um, uh, non-sexual intercourse forms of touching. You can uh, discuss um, self and mutual stimulation. You can talk about having oral sex as an alternative um, and trying different positions, perhaps using um, a variety of sex toys. Um, and other devices. You can also talk heavily about um, non-sexual forms of intimacy that deepen the relationship and give you other ways of feeling connected to and very close to your partner. Um, and this could be particularly in the case of people who have chronic pain that is caused by um, illnesses or disabilities that are um, going to, to really pretty much um, either eliminate or drastically reduce your capacity for sexual interactions in the form of intercourse. Fatigue and chronic fatigue, like chronic pain, can arise out of a variety of different conditions, um, whether you're talking about mental illnesses, physical in illnesses, um, neurological conditions, and so on. Um, chronic illness and disability are frequently um, uh, coupled with the experience of fatigue and tiredness and weakness. Um, and regardless of the type of chronic Ill illness or disability that you're referring to, it may result from the condition itself, it, but it could also result from medications and other treatments that people are being exposed to. So one thing that people with chronic illnesses and disabilities often report is that they, they are fatigued, they're exhausted perhaps by the illness itself, by its symptoms, but they also report that they may 
because of their medications, be feeling foggy and tired and sleepy. Um, perhaps some of their treatments are exhausting. So for example, if you're going through a course of chemotherapy, that is a very arduous process. It can sometimes be painful. It can sometimes involve nausea and physical changes like the loss of hair um, and so on. All of that can be reported by people to their, their care providers as exhausting and fatigue inducing. Emotional and psychological stress by themselves tend to be things that can um, predict fatigue. So when people are under a persistent amount of stress, they can become tired, they can become um, weary and, and exhausted because of that stress. Some interventions that, can, that are suggested if you are experiencing um, a chronic illness and disability that's accompanied by a high degree of fatigue for um, maintaining your sexual interactions with a partner, um, people are encouraged to kind of think about their day. What are the times of the day when they feel the best, when they feel the least fatigued, the least tired, and the least um, uh, weakened uh, by their disability or whatever's going on with them? And then to move their sexual interactions to that time of day. You know, it, and it may be uh, not the time of day that you're used to having sexual interactions. So for instance, if you usually have uh, sex with your partner at night, at bedtime, but you're, you don't, you, the time of the day when you feel the worst is in the evening, you may say, the time of day that I feel the best is first thing in the morning when I've had some sleep. You and your partner may want to explore that alternative time. Uh, for having sexual interactions. You may explore different positions that are less um, physically uh, arduous, and uh, you may explore other kinds of sexual positions or techniques like non-coital sexual acts that are less physically demanding um, for you if fatigue is a problem. It's also important to remember that you can use counseling um, to talk through whatever conflicts you might be having. People who report chronic fatigue are often um, interpreted by their partners. Um, I wouldn't say often, sometimes seen by their partners as making a big deal out of nothing. Um, if that is the case, that is something that can be worked through through communication and having a counselor to work through some of that can be really helpful. And that's especially the case if if care providers and medical professionals are really not giving attention to fatigue as an outgrowth of an illness or disability, or if the person's primary complaint is that they are fatigued, um, healthcare professionals often unfortunately dismiss that as a uh, something that's quote unquote in people's heads and not warranting clinical attention. Um, so that's something that a counselor can be helpful with for couples. Having to undergo surgery can have impacts in terms of sexual um, experience and sexual expression. Um, in some cases, having a surgical procedure to correct a problem can be a positive, can be a net positive. So for example, having um, a back problem that has been debilitating, repaired, um, and restoring the person's function or reducing their pain can increase their level of sexual satisfaction and sexual activity. Or removing fibroids or addressing endometriosis could reduce the level of sexual intercourse pain for females. Though, so there can be positive effects. You get a problem that's taken care of, it increases your level of functioning, it decreases your negative symptoms, that can have a positive impact for sexuality. Surgeries, though, in some cases can have negative impacts, and some of them can be quite direct. If you have had to have gynecological surgery for, say, cancer or some other structural problem, um, there can be impacts for sexual satisfaction, depending on the nature of the surgery and the nature of the disease being treated. Um, in some cases, surgeries can affect your reproductive function. Um, if a person has ovarian cancer, they may have to have their ovaries removed. That means you're on a fast track to menopause. You may have to be thinking about hormone replacement. 
um, and and other associated treatments after that that uh, surgical intervention. Um, removing parts of the body, such as what I've just described, and in your text, they have a long list of types of surgeries that can have sexual impacts. I didn't feel it was necessary to repeat all of those here. Um, you can look at those lists. You know, a lot of them on the list are surgeries for cancers um, of the, the sexual organs or of the regions of the body that are relevant to, to sexual functioning, such as the breasts. Um, Changing your physicality in any way um, can influence how you see yourself, how, how you understand your sexual self. It, if you are perceiving yourself now as less attractive or as damaged, um, navigating that, that new physical self can be um, difficult. So again, like so many other things, counseling can help and working with, working with the problem with your partner in in open communication tends to lead to better outcomes for people. I've mentioned before that medications uh, of various forms and chemotherapies for the treatment of, of cancer and related disorders can have sexual side effects for many people. Um, there are, just before we, we go into the downsides, there are some medications that improve sexual functioning. We've talked in class a number of times about Viagra and related medications that are designed to improve the, the quality and length of, um, the, the length of time that an erection is maintained uh, for males. Um, we've also talked briefly about um, analogous medications for women. Certainly the, the options there are more common for, for males. Um, so there are some medications that can improve sexual functioning. Um, there are, however, many drugs that have documented um, potential negative effects. And remember, before we go into this, only a minority of people experience these side effects. It's just that they're common enough that they're listed as potential side effects for these categories of medications. Um, antidepressants, um, particularly selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, some of them have been reported to decrease sex drive and decrease kind of the, the level of arousal that people report. Um, again, it's um, a minority of people who take those medications who report these effects. For many, um, if the, the medications for depression are effective in and of themselves for the treatment that they're being used to treat, um, in other words, if they actually help to reduce the person's depression, what most people report is that their sexual functioning improves. Um, however, for some people, they do report um, a, a diminishment of their interest in, in sexual interaction. Um, high blood pressure medications um, can have negative impacts on um, the ability to attain erections um, because their you know, erections require um, that uh, you have adequate blood flow and adequate blood pressure. If you are artificially reducing blood pressure to treat hypertension, um, though some of those medications can interfere with that. Um, there are some drugs for um, heartburn that have been reported to have sexual side effects uh, in terms of sexual desire and um, arousal. Some pain medications can cause effects that have trickle down impacts on sexuality. Um, some of the pain medications, particularly the, the uh, narcotic type pain medications, the opioids, can make people too sleepy, um, can cause other sort of GI tract problems such as constipation and nausea that make sex uncomfortable um, for people. Um, chemotherapy medications, you know, there's, that's a huge category of different types of drugs. Um, and radiation treatments for cancer can produce fatigue, they can produce nausea, they can also produce uh, fairly dramatic changes in the person's physicality, all of which can impact um, sexual desire and sexual expression. 
There are many drugs um, that can affect your fertility um, and your, your reproductive capacity. So there are some drugs that interfere with fertility and sometimes that's on purpose, such as birth control pills. But there are, are some drugs that can do that not purposefully and it, it can cause um, some trickle down effects in terms of sexual arousal and sexual interest. So the bottom line is many medications can have sexual side effects. Unfortunately, healthcare professionals don't always inform uh, their patients that this may be a problem that they experience. You know, it kind of goes with that general um, tendency for healthcare providers to kind of sidestep the, the conversation about sex and sexual effects. So they, they may not make that a primary part of their conversation since their interest is patient, you need to take this medication to control whatever the symptoms are of your illness, or you need to take this medication to cure your disease. Um, their primary concern may not be, you know, right in the front of their mind, their patient's sexuality. Um, in some cases, though, that's an important conversation because if, you, if a patient doesn't know that there might be sexual side effects, they may then find that out and say, fine, I'm not taking this medication, period. So they may not be treatment compliant. Um, and that can be problematic for the person's general health and their ability to recover um, from a variety of different conditions. So it's an important conversation to have with your healthcare provider. If you're being prescribed a new medication, initiate the conversation about side effects generally. And if you're concerned, ask about sexual side effects. If you've rather, you'd rather not have that conversation with your healthcare provider, there are a number of resources that you can go to online for looking up those informations. Little warning though, when you, when you look at side effect profiles of drugs, remember the statistical facts of how those sort of side effect profiles are created. They come from a number of sources. They come from clinical trials and what the people involved in clinical trials have reported, but they, all come, they also come from adverse event reporting where people can report in and tell um, the FDA what their experiences were. If you're looking online for side effect information, avoid public comment boards or chat rooms because what you're getting there is people's individual experiences, which I'm not discounting, but those experiences need to go through the lens of people with actual experience and the research background to interpret those experiences. Now I'll shift to um, alcohol and drugs and how those, the use of alcohol and drugs can affect um, sexuality and sexual expression and especially for young people, but not just for them, but since you are college students taking this class, my conversation here will skew toward your population. We're gonna start with alcohol and sexuality. Um, you, you may or may not be aware that alcohol, generally speaking, is a central nervous system depressant, meaning it relaxes you. Um, some people experience that differently. For some people, they find being a little bit tipsy to be energizing, um, whereas other people find it very relaxing. Um, so there are differences in the way inter people interpret their own physical experience and psychological experience of consuming alcohol. But generally speaking, it's a CNS depressant. Um, if you consume enough alcohol, um, so we're talking about if people have become drunk, um, the physiological suppression of sexual response, the physiological sexual response tends to be suppressed. Um, in other words, if you're talking about um, the speed with which a male uh, gets an erection, that would be suppressed. It would be slowed down. If you're talking about the degree to which um, a female becomes um, physically aroused, maybe in terms of lubrication, that is suppressed, or how quickly they move through the sexual response cycle for both males and females could be slowed down. Now, in some cases, that's a good thing. In other cases, that's, that's a bad thing. If you're expecting your body to respond as it has previously, 
um, and it doesn't, that can be um, troubling for people. Now, for many college students in particular, but this finding is not just for people, you know, in their, their late teens and early 20s, uh, many report that, that drinking a little bit is a part of the ritual of their sexual experiences. Um, as a result, many report that they drink to enhance intimacy. Um, now, you can interpret this in a lot of different ways. You know, I'm a social psychologist. My tendency is to say, you know, we as Americans in our culture, we tend to associate, um, you know, one-on-one -on -one intimate experiences as uh, often involving alcohol consumption. Um, if you think about TV shows or movies that you've watched, when people are on an intimate date, they're often drinking. So part of the narrative of our intimate interactions tends to include um, alcohol consumption. So to me, it's not surprising that many people on surveys report that they drink because it helps them um, feel sexually intimate with their partner. Um, that could be a self-fulfilling prophecy, essentially. Some people also report, and this is a little more troubling, that they, dr they drink so that they can kind of numb down the negative feelings that they have about sex. Um, for example, um, in some studies of people who have, been, have experienced sexual trauma, sexual abuse, um, sexual assault, for example, report that um, the experience of, of sex can be anxiety provoking. It can reintroduce traumatizing imagery to them. So they find the experience of sexual intimacy to be anxiety provoking. Um, some cope with that by drinking a bit because it, it, they report it reduces their anxiety and the, their level of arousal generally so that they're not so keyed up. Um, and that way they can relax and, and have sex. Now on a more pathological note, for some people, uh, and this is not the norm, certainly some people report that they need to be drunk. They need to cross that threshold from tipsy uh, and happily buzzed into being actually intoxicated in order to have sex with their partner. In, in that case, that's a more troubling kind of situation that warrants more concern. Now, you also have to look at, you know, beyond sexual in, encounters, um, what people report using alcohol for. You also have to think, what would, what is the long-term impact of uh, alcohol abuse? So there, we're not talking about um, normal levels of casual uh, drinking. Uh, but instead long-term abusive patterns of alcohol use. Um, drinking alcohol uh, to in excess, um, and there are lots of ways of defining that. I'm not going to go into that here, but there are lots of long-term negative health impacts and mental health impacts of long-term alcohol abuse. Um, so whether you're talking about uh, using the concept of alcoholism or just substance abuse, whatever words you choose to use, when people drink a lot and they drink every day, um, or they drink, um, they binge drink routinely, um, over time, that's going to have cumulative negative health effects for people. For men um, who are uh, chronic users of alcohol, they can be found to have decreased testosterone, which then leads to um, some feminizing effects in terms of secondary sex characteristics. It, it can also affect their sex drive and um, uh, long-term alcohol abuse can cause erectile dysfunction in people because alcohol use um, and abuse can affect your circulatory system. It affects obviously the liver. Um, it affects brain function and all of those can have an impact in terms of people's um, ability to have an erection. For women, um, long-term alcohol abuse can interfere with the menstrual cycle um, and can even induce early menopause in some cases. Again, you know, alcohol, as one of my one of my colleagues put it, 
you know, basically alcohol is by definition a poison. So it shouldn't surprise us that if we abuse alcohol, if we drink far too much, far too often, and far too consistently, the body can't heal itself from the effect of that poison. So it shouldn't surprise us that there are some long-term negative health effects for alcohol abuse. Now I found this, this piece of data, um, since you are all young people in this class, um, I found this piece of information and I've posted the link to the article where this table comes from so that you can look at it. I posted it on D12. Um, and they wanted to find out how many currently active, uh, sexually active high school students reported drinking or using drugs before their last sexual intercourse encounter. And what they found was that a significant percentage, so um, well over 20%, so you know, uh, looking at this, this table, about 23% reported that they had. Um, for girls, about 18, 19%. For boys, um, they're reporting about 26% um, had reported using uh, alcohol and or drugs before their last sexual intercourse experience. Now I post this for you because in our culture, given that we have a tendency to link um, using drugs and alcohol, primarily alcohol at a cultural level, with sexual behavior, it's almost ubiquitous in, in our presentations of uh, romance narratives and of uh, just intimate relationships in general in media. Sexual encounters tend to involve drugs and alcohol. So it's not surprising that about a quarter of sexually active high school students report actively using alcohol and or drugs as a part of their sexual encounters. Um, this, the same link uh, presented this, this set of figures, um, and here you're, you're, they're incorporating a study coming from a different data point or a different data, set of data. They asked people, have you ever had unprotected sex? So here the question is about um, alcohol, drugs, and unsafe sex. Um, and basically what people responded to that question was that you know, 66% reported that yes, they've had unprotected sex under the influence of alcohol. And that should be pretty disturbing. So what that points to is that alcohol and other drugs um, can interfere with good high quality decision making since these drugs and alcohol tend to be disinhibiting. They may interfere with your capacity to kind of think through the pros and cons to really carefully um, articulate consent and so on. So, you know, a very, a fairly high percentage said that they, yeah, they had. Um, a lower percentage said no, they hadn't. And, and about 1% said they weren't sure, which probably means they did. Um, when people are asked whether they use quote unquote recreational drugs, and, you know, that can be anything from, from pot to X to, cocaine and meth or even heroin, although heroin is typically, heroin and meth are typically described in um, the popular press as quote unquote hard drugs. Um, so they're, they're reporting using recreational drugs, 15% responded yes to that question, 85% responded no. And then when they're asked, have you ever had unprotected sex while using recreational drugs? 26% um, said yes. So alcohol um, tends to be the, since it is a legal drug, people are, are more comfortable reporting their levels of use um, in contrast to even recreational drugs, which typically are illegal depending on your jurisdiction. Um, so people may be inhibited from, from kind of describing their level of usage. But with alcohol, what you see is if people are drinking and having sex, their level of unprotected sex goes up. Um, if we go back to that table on high school students, you can make some guesses about the if they're using alcohol, a good chunk of them, that group of people who are using alcohol um, while under 
while they're having sex, a good chunk of them, the majority, in fact, are likely to be having unprotected sex. Um, which, you know, given you've all survived high school, that probably does not surprise Alcohol, drugs, and and uh, consuming alcohol and drugs it has been associated with a variety of unsafe sex practices. Um, you know, f for one, um, consuming alcohol and drugs has been found to be associated with having unprotected sex. So not using condoms, not using dental dams, um, not using appropriate um, protected sex uh, techniques of other kinds has been associated with um, with drinking. What you can see in this this uh, table is that the percentage of people in count, engaging in unsafe sex practices um, with a with and with and then the outcome variable being their um, rates of STI infection, you can see that it goes up with the amount of alcohol consumed. Um, Consuming alcohol and drugs is also associated with an increased risk of sexual assault. Um, and that's not to say that people who consume alcohol and drugs are at fault uh, or are to blame for being assaulted, but it does tend to be associated with um, being victimized. Um, so it's something to keep very carefully in mind. Um, it also increases the risk of a variety of forms of risky sexual behaviors. And that can also include, um, if you're drunk, if you're high, um, being more willing to cross that line into sexually assaultive behavior, such as ignoring um, indications of consent or not paying attention to the fact that you're having sex with someone who is impaired uh, by alcohol and drugs. Other kinds of risky sexual behaviors, including having unprotected sex, would be things like hooking up with people that you don't know, without taking any kind of safety protocols to make other people aware of where you're going, um, engaging in sexual acts, specific forms of sex that are dangerous for you, um, perhaps risking physical injuries or um, uh, the transmission of, of STIs. For example, people who are um, drunk or high may be more willing to engage in anal sex or other kinds of sexual behaviors that they otherwise wouldn't do and that, that come with, uh, unless you're taking appropriate uh, steps to prepare, can come with risks for people involved. Um, I've already mentioned the increased risk of STI infections, and primarily that's connected to the increased risk of uh, engaging in unprotected sex. So that concludes uh, my discussion of part two of chapter 11, the interaction between health and um, sexuality. A lot to, to take in there. The chapter, you know, it, it's in some ways kind of disjointed. It's a long list of ways in which your health interacts with um, your sexual experiences. Um, so that's that's all for part two. Um, I look forward to talking with you again.